Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our product success session. Today, we're going to be talking about how to refine your process uh, and maximize value from your product methodology. Uh, as we get started, I am launching a quick poll uh, on the poll tab, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, answering that. Thank you, whoever that first person was. <laughs> uh, so just a quick brief, uh, what are product success sessions? Uh, we generally focus on a different area um, every couple months. Uh, we'll discuss set up an implementation and share best practice and functionality for success uh, with ProdPad. If you have uh, any questions, uh, you are absolutely invited to talk. Um, just click on the um, raise my hand or raise your hand option uh, in Zoom. If you're a little bit shy, we totally get that. Uh, just type it up on the Q&A um, and I'll be sure to read out your questions back um, to Emma, who's with me today. Uh, again, uh, quick, uh, before I forget to mention this, this is being recorded. So if you have to drop off, thank you Emma, for going back. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we will be sending out the recording later. Uh, I am Andrea, uh, which is the next slide. This is me. Uh, you might be quite familiar with me. <laughs> I currently uh, manage product growth and education here at ProdPad previously a product manager as well, first product pet employee, um, and I'm around pretty much everywhere. Uh, and with me today is Emma, who is our customer success manager. Emma, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm one of the customer success managers at ProdPad. Um, before I joined ProdPad, I was actually a product manager myself um, at a learn tech company where I implemented ProdPad um, at that organization. Um, involved in a couple of different um, meetups. Um, but before all of that, I was actually a project manager uh, for my sins. So as Andrew mentioned, in this session today, we're going to look at how you can leverage ProdPad to refine your processes um, and maximize the value from your product methodology. Um, so a couple of things we're gonna go through today is uh, looking at like typical product processes. So obviously everyone works in very different ways, but they tend to follow um, very sort of standard um, set parts of that process, how these things all then map together in ProdPad, how you can map ProdPad to your processes. Um, and then we're gonna just pick out a couple of popular um, methodologies and sort of talk you through some examples of how your ProdPad might be set up slightly different uh, depending on the methodology of, of choice. So obviously, like I mentioned, every product team and organization um, will have their product processes set up in very different ways. Um, but essentially, um, you're basically always doing three essential activities um, as effectively as possible. So learning about your customers and their problems in order to build successful products that solve those problems. And then in order to continue learning, you're measuring uh, what you've built to ensure um, that you have uh, created successful products and it hits the problems that you hoped you would solve. So quick question, just uh, straight out the gate. Um, what do you think is the method methodology of choice for your product team or organization? And Andrew's just going to pop up a poll here. It'd be useful just to understand what are the main uh, methodologies you, you choose. Agile is taking the lead. Uh, cool. That's good. So we have... Uh, Oh, here we go. More came through. Uh, might give people a couple of more minutes or seconds just to, to fill those out. Um, but so far we have Agile as number one, mm -hmm. um, Lean and Dual Track Agile uh, tied at second, and then Design Thinking uh, last. Brilliant. Well, Dual Track Agile and Design Thinking are going to be a couple of the ones we show examples of. So that's that's pretty useful then. Hopefully we'll be able to share some thoughts on that. Thank you. So like I mentioned, regardless of your process or like methodology of choice, most product processes actually look like this and are following these key concepts and ideas of identifying the objectives um, like strategically for your organization and the products um, and then understanding your customer problems 
um, in order to prioritize the most effective solutions and deliver on something to resolve that problem. And obviously understanding uh, feedback then um, as to whether you did solve that problem or not. So regardless of what your methodology is, you will probably be touching on most of these uh, parts of a typical product process. Um, so so it's split into two parts, really, the process that we'll look at today. So the strategic decisions at an organizational level or maybe at an individual product level, what are the key outcomes you're trying to achieve and, and what metrics are you going to try and tweak and focus on those areas? Um, these can be phrased slightly differently. So we've got examples here of like outcomes versus goals. So outcomes tend to be more um, uh, like outcome focused, like for example, growing revenue. Um, it's less easy to measure. It's more of like a behavior change. Um, oh, sorry, no. Defending against competitive threat, sorry, is an outcome um, phrased approach. So as I say, that's more of like a behavior change. It's less easy to measure. Whereas a goal focused objective might be phrased more like growing revenue. You're more easily to um, track the change there. Um, and then the key results out of that focus on the direct outcome from the specific activities um, that you're trying to measure and learn from. So even if you don't set objectives, um, outcomes will happen anyway. You just won't really have set out what you're trying to achieve or be able to measure it effectively. So if you're not looking at the strategic side with the objectives, it's definitely worth setting out from the offset what you're trying to achieve and have more conversations around this. So it's a easier to measure it um, and see if you're successful or not. And then in order to make these decisions, you need to have um, a proper discovery process as well. So you need to map these objectives to how you're going to try and achieve them. Um, you're mapping them to key problems you're looking to solve within your product or for your customers. And it's important to then separate those problems out from the potential solutions to those problems. And the solutions are normally around your like um, specific ideas, it might be a feature or an experiment you might run in order to solve that problem. And all of this sits separately to your delivery process, which will have its own process, maybe managed by tech leads. Um, in things like JIRA, which we'll touch on. Um, so discovery would sit separately to delivery um, because there's a lot of work uh, that goes into understanding your customer problems and deciding which areas you're going to focus on. But this is where PropPad really can help you with the decision making and making sure you're working on the right problems and prioritizing effectively. Um, so this is what it looks like all together. And it's important to make sure that Although these processes, like all three really, the, the objective setting process, the discovery process, the delivery process, these might all be like mapped and sit quite separately, but it's important to make sure that they're integrated together in order to help you to make sure you're prioritizing um, effectively and uh, your time is spent on working on the right problems and solutions to meet those desired outcomes and objectives at that strategic level. And this will help with like organizational alignment as well. Um, in this example, you can see a little bit of what we'll talk about, about where PropPad uh, fits in um, to some of these areas of the process, um, as well as things like which uh, internal stakeholders take ownership over different areas or involved in different areas of the process. So uh, for the middle section of uh, today, we'll look at breaking each section down of the process before we look at the specific examples based on certain methodologies. But next, we've got our next um, poll question, if you wouldn't mind, um, which is in that overall process, so strategy, um, discovery and delivery, where do you think your team tends to struggle the most? Um, and not to bias any responses, but I would tend to see when I'm um, speaking with different um, people, I tend to see that actually the problem um, definition space tends to be one of the most uh, trickiest areas for people to overcome from, especially if they're moving from like a feature factory approach, say. Um, Andrea, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on what you see most as well. I, oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I think even regardless of whether you're 
more of feature focused or outcome focused, I find that managing feedback tends to be an issue. Mm. Uh, mostly because if you're feature focused, you're not managing feedback in the first place. So then when you have to, <laughs> you don't really know where to get started. Mm. Um, but the results are in. Um, I don't want to call it the winner because I don't think there's a winner in any of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, the top response is outcome, uh, which kind of makes sense. Um, mm. if, you're, if you're going from being a feature focused to being outcome focused, that can be a bit of a of an interesting change. Uh, we then have uh, feedback. <laughs> so okay, yeah. feedback. You were right. <laughs> yeah, I was right. Feedback is second. Uh, we then have problems and iteration uh, tied. And then uh, last ones are solutions and delivery. Which makes sense because I guess a lot of uh, starting points for companies is around, uh, you know, deciding what, you know, especially if you've started off um, being led by certain internal stakeholders deciding what features you're going to build um and often if you're having focusing on like the tech team and delivery so it makes sense that those would be a bit more um process might be a bit more well defined um although not that they're not without problems thank you for sharing so we'll focus on the strategic side first and how propad can support with these um sorts of processes so with the objectives, um, your outcomes and goals can be documented in PropAd. And obviously, we're going to show you um, how you can do this with objectives and key results. Like I mentioned before, although I got it in a muddle, uh, the wording can be different. So it, we've got the examples here of we've got like outcome objectives versus like goal objectives. So like I mentioned, something like defend against competitive threat, that's more of an outcome focused phrased objective. Whereas grow revenue is more of like a goal focused objective, something that's going to be easier to measure. Um, so these are the key um, areas of PropAd that can help. I'm just going to jump into PropAd now and show you where these are. So if we start off with the portfolio objectives, so important to note that we have two types of objectives in PropAd, portfolio and product objectives. Um, the key difference is portfolio objectives can be used across your products. So they might be more um, like organizational wide objectives, whereas you can also then have more product specific objectives that you're just looking to work on on those individual products. So there's separate sections where you can create these and, and track them. So each objective will have like a title and description. And then if you've got um, key results in there, and that's something that we're looking to um, have as an add-on. So if you don't have it yet, it should be um, something you can look to have in the near future. Um, you can track key results of these uh, objectives. So on each key result, you can show which are the contributing roadmap cards um, that you're working towards uh, achieving that key result. And you can mark whether they're uh, whether that key results on track, behind or at risk, you can add things like status change comments and things. So a really useful way for you to be able to document what your objectives are and then also measure um, the key results and whether you're successful in achieving that based on your roadmap card initiatives. So that's at the portfolio objectives level and that is also at the product specific level too. So again, very similar looking. You've got the product objectives, you can also have your key results and you can also see the portfolio objectives and these can then be added to your roadmap cards. You can see that this one's just a product specific one and this one's a portfolio objective. The reason I can tell that is because the portfolio one has lots of different cubes which are representing all the products that um, it like, sort of sits across. So that's from the objectives and key results. We also have importantly, the completed section of your roadmap where you can document the completed roadmap card initiatives, as well as seeing like the date. Importantly, you can add details about the outcome of completing this card. So for example, the event page, we were hoping to increase engagement and we've been able to track the results and document them in here to say that we increased engagement by 26%. So if we're looking at a roadmap card initiative in the future around engagement, we can filter our completed cards by that, review the outcome and sort of make informed decisions on our roadmap moving forward as well. So 
So just jump back in. So quick question time, just uh, wanted to understand if you are using objectives and or key results, if you have access to them in ProbPad at the moment. Like I mentioned, uh, key results we're looking to um, introduce as an add on in the near future. So it'd be interesting. I was going to say the first response was the one that says, can't wait to get my hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd add that one in because I know we um, we we do have some eager beavers that are ready to, to get going with that. So. So the responses are coming in and without surprise, the number one answer is just objectives. Can't wait to get my hands on key results. Brilliant. Well, that's good. Well, uh, just shows we prioritized our roadmap correctly and it's uh, going to be heading your way soon. And if you haven't already indicated to us that you would like um, that you're interested in the add on, then just drop us a line in here and we'll add you to the list so that when it does get released, um, we can drop you a line and let you know. So moving on to the discovery part of the product management process. So our ProPads roadmap ideas and feedback management then will help to support the discovery and prioritization at this um, part of the process. Um, but we'll separate each of these out and look at them in more detail and how ProPad can help support each of, this, um, each of these sections. So the first is around um, the problems. Um, two key areas around this is uh, through our roadmap cards and also feedback. Um, with your roadmap cards, your problems are highlighted as the roadmap card itself, and you can order these um, to show the priority order. We've also got like an impact and effort score as well to help you to reflect that prioritization. Um, and like we mentioned with the outcomes aspect, this is where you can show the objectives that they'll be um, working towards. So each roadmap card is the problem you're trying to solve. And then the ideas attached to it are how you're going to try and solve that problem. Um, that, that could be like a feature, potential opportunity, or an experiment. And again, you can order these as well within the card to represent the priority order. And then the objectives, which I showed you in the um, ProPad instance. And again, you can show those at the product objective level or the portfolio level objectives as well. Um, so quick question again, um, do you phrase roadmap cards as problems or do you struggle sometimes to effectively describe them as a problem um, and instead keep sort of getting stuck at um, describing your how keeping your initiatives around a feature rather than the problem you're trying to solve? Like I mentioned, this is something that I do often speak with customers about, so be interested to understand um, if this is a problem for you as well. So the results are coming in and so far it looks like 58% um, have said still features working on phrasing as problems. 25% um, have said uh, nice stakeholders needs to see features uh, on the roadmap. Uh, and 17% have said a mix of problems and features. That's very helpful. Thank you. So we do have um, quite a few resources on our help center that can help with um, moving to more of like an outcome focused road mapping approach. Um, and maybe we could also look at doing um, a future session around how to um, phrase um, things as problems. We also are looking at introducing um, training as well. Um, so if that would be of interest of you, to you, if you think that maybe that might be um, something that would help in uh, some training around defining problems and and, for, and how to develop more outcome focused road mapping, then drop us a, a note in the chat um, or just like privately message Andrew in chat and we can follow up with you. Um, so looking at problems uh, from a feedback perspective, obviously ProPad we have a whole feedback section and where whereas ideas in ProPad you, you really just want one version of an idea. With feedback, you want to um, capture all feedback. You want multiple versions of that feedback and that problem. 
so that you can build up that evidence of need that that um, that, that idea is worth uh, prioritizing. Um, so we have like a unique feedback system if you're not already using it that allows you to collect customer feedback from lots of different sources. Um, we'll touch on some of um, the ways we do that later. Um, and feedback then can be linked to either uh, just contacts or companies as well, depending on whether you're like B2C or B2B, um, along with any extra relevant information and contacts so you know who's asking for what sort of things. Um, and like I say, the, the real main point of using feedback to help with defining problems and um, building evidence of needs with your ideas um, and the, the really exploring the problems that you're looking to prioritize um, in your backlog. Um, and how this is done is on each idea, we can show you uh, how many pieces of feedback that you um, have attached to each idea. Obviously, one piece of feedback could be attached to multiple ideas because there's not always just one solution to a problem. And then you can dig into who is giving that feedback. Um, and um, you can see here we've got like how many how many people have given the feedback. You can also see like what companies have come from. You can filter by like company value, size, things like job roles, personas. So you can really dig in to understand who's giving this feedback. Um, and then you can um, contact them. So we collect their email as part of like their unique identifier. So you can export their details, contact them however you would normally communicate with your customers and either talk to them about um, like user testing or or like maybe you're testing a prototype with them, user research, just to understand that problem further or further down in the process to help close that feedback loop, which we'll touch on. So the next part of the process is around the solutions. Um, so this really is split into like three different sections of how Propa can support. So we've got potential solutions and Prob will look at the ideas and workflow for how we can support that. And then you've got prioritized solutions. So how do we help you to prioritize then all these new ideas that are being generated and, and you're trying to work through? And that's with the roadmap cards and ideas, we'll come back to that. And then we've already kind of touched on, but how you um, add the feedback and build up that evidence of need and attach them to all the different ideas. So if anyone's ever spoken to me, um, I always talk about the workflow as one of the most important parts of PropPad. Um, and if you haven't already, this should be updated to reflect your own um, ideation process. So um, normally it would have your discovery phases and anything else that's like pre-delivery. Um, you would then have um, your development steps, which would be synced with your development tool like Jira or Trello as your DevOps, so that we can pull back the status and then you'd have any post development phases too, post release, measuring success, any marketing, closing that feedback loop, everything would be documented in here. Um, and like I say, they're completely customizable. And all ideas will start off obviously in the discovery um, early on in this early on in the workflow. And then um, you can basically move them across. And this, as we'll touch on when we look a little bit at the dual track agile, this is where we really support you keeping the discovery process moving at the same time as development, because we keep all that information um, as you're scoping out ideas and, and working through discovery all in ProdPad. So you can pick it up, work on it for a few weeks, put it down, come back to it in six months, a year, and know exactly where you got to with it. I think we actually, we actually looked at an idea and reopened it and it was like from like four years ago or something wasn't it, Andrew I think recently so it just goes to show 2013 that 2013 so like <laughs> ideas are all valid and you never know at what point in the future you will actually want to look back at them again and maybe have enough evidence um and it become prioritized so that's that's one of the key benefits of, of prop pad and the workflow um and as we've already touched on these prioritized ideas as the sort of solution side would then um, appear on your roadmap um, as part of the sort of joined up to then that problem definition and the like objective definition process. And by adding the feedback to these potential ideas, you're building up that evidence of need, which will help you with prioritizing those ideas that you are then 
adding to your prioritized roadmap cards. So lots of prioritizing going on, but it's all interconnected and we help you keep them all moving at one time. So the next um, part we'll move on to is delivery. The key aspect like this of this, which we've already touched on, is our integration with delivery tools and making sure we're syncing that status. So looking back in the, the workflow view, um, what happens is if we look at the discovery process, you'll have this mapped out and it'll include um, any like scoping design. So effectively, ProdPad sits upstream of JIRA and keeps your JIRA backlog nice and, and clear of um, any, any potential ideas and things you're not sure about so that your JIRA backlog just has prioritized work that has um, enough scope and detail on it that the development team can actively work on it straight away. So your JIRA backlog is less cluttered and ProdPad obviously is all set up to help you with discovery and making sure you're scoping effectively. So you can see here that the Google Maps integration and MailChimp integration, these are synced with JIRA. And just as an extra example, we've got uh, Dropbox synced with Azure DevOps. So what, you'll probably have like some, some form of like ready for dev um, status in your workflow or like prioritize for next sprint or sprint planning, whatever it might be. Um, and then it would be synced with JIRA and we pull back the sync, uh, the status from JIRA. So as that ticket is worked on in ProdPad, in JIRA, it will pull back the status into ProdPad and it will move it across for you. So you don't have to keep updating different tools. ProdPad will keep updated. Um, so how we do this is based on your integration setup. You can have multiple integrations. So if you have different teams that maybe work in slightly different ways, um, you can set up multiple integrations. You pick the project, pick where you want the ideas and user stories to go in um, JIRA, and then you will do your field mapping. So what, where do you want the title to go? Where do you want the description to go? And also the workflow stages, like I mentioned. And one of the benefits of the workflow stage mapping is normally in JIRA with the development stages and like QA steps, you might have multiple stages like code reviews and um, different QA stages. But actually, from like a strategic point of view and um, other people that have access to ProdPad, you don't necessarily need to know where it is in the development flow. You just need to know, is it in development or is it in QA? Um, so that can help um, use ProdPad as like a window into JIRA where not everyone really can like understands what, what the status actually means, makes it a bit more understandable. Um, and so, like I mentioned, with your ideas you would make sure that you've um, it's gone through the workflow here it's queued for dev it's got designs on it it's got user stories it's fully scoped um, and then you would hit the push to development button and then it would create the ticket like i mentioned in jira and would create that sync um, and so once you have released something into the wild you want to keep that feedback loop going. So it's interesting that we've mentioned feedback so many times. It's because throughout this whole process, you're constantly wanting to learn um, and measure and, and bring feedback into the loop as you're iterating um, and learning and, and de de sort of working out what the best approach is going to be um, to have the most success with what you're working on. So once you've delivered something, you want feedback to see if it did the thing you hoped it would. So we support on these in, in a couple of different ways with our portal and um, widget that you can customize. Um, and I'll show you what ours looks like. Um, and then how to like add that feedback to ideas, just in case you, you aren't sure how to do that. So just an example, I'll, I'll show you where we use the feedback portal and widget on our website. Um, so if you want to give us any feedback at any time, these are the places that you can you can do it as well as like just dropping us a line. Um, so our feedback portal is in here and we collect any suggestions or feedback that you have. Um, you can tweak this text as well if you're looking to create your own. And then we pull through uh, existing ideas from your backlog that you can mark as if I just, I can show you actually. So in here you can see show on portal. If you mark that green, then it will show up in the um, portal um, that you've created. And then again, if you uh, want to give specific feedback on that, you can uh, 
you're basically faced with the portal again and you can fill in the details and add your specific feedback so rather than um like some other feedback tools um Ten, like sometimes use voting systems but what we found when we did the research and building the feedback portal was that those tools tend to be quite biased so people either just tend to look at the top or the most popular ones um, so the bottom ones don't really get a look in so uh, and all, all you get really is a, a vote rather than understanding of why and the problems that they're looking to solve by wanting that feature or potential solution so that's why we went with with this approach just to give you more um, information really useful information to help you prioritize effectively um, rather than just counting numbers and, and going with that the widget view you can see on our roadmap so if you're ever interested in what we're working on next there's the add-ons um, you can check out our roadmap on our website and you can see the little widget down here where rather than the other feedback portal is around um, just general feedback this one's specifically been set up to get feedback on our roadmap um, and again you're um, asked for feedback and then the next stage is your name and email exactly like on the portal and then so those are the different um, tools we have available for you to um, capture feedback um, and then when it comes to adding feedback to ideas so i know i've shown like the numbers but i haven't shown you how to do that so when you're reviewing your feedback as well as obviously having a little conversation so maybe charlotte is on our sales team and ha and you know gave this information that chris would like google maps but we don't actually know why so i might want to go back to charlotte and ask did he explain why he wants google maps what problem he's trying to solve um but once i'm um happy with this feedback the next step would be to add it to an idea and build up that evidence of need like we mentioned so we have our dot bot which looks through other existing ideas in your backlog and suggests ones that might be relevant for you to um, connect that feedback to or alternatively you can search in your backlog and add it to any relevant ideas and then that will then show you like i showed before in the slides you can then see when you're reviewing this idea working through the workflow how many customers have given that feedback um, and you can drill down into uh, any specific company value or job role or persona for example um, and really look into into that feedback and help with um, prioritization and, and learning moving forward so quick question time um, are you using feedback to help prioritize your ideas um and maybe andrea i don't know if you might be able to talk a little bit about how we use feedback um like our, how we manage feedback at propag because i know it's something that we we do quite well um yeah so our our feedback process um uh, is pretty tight i think <laughs> we, we, we run a tight ship um in that every piece of feedback that comes in is first triaged by me um, and then triaged by your senior product manager. So two people get to look at it um, at the very least. Uh, so when it is initially comes in, I'll just make sure that it's added to the right product as we do manage multiple products internally, whether it's the actual PropPet app or an improvement for our help center or our marketing website or our services or anything like that. Um, the second step would be to um, add any tags, any personas, any ideas if I already know them. Um, and the third and most important step is to just make sure that we have enough information. Um, and if we do not, then I will either tag uh, Emma, Wes, uh, who is also on the line, uh, or Ellie, uh, depending on you know, who might be managing uh, or be communicating with the customer. It'll most likely be Ellie, uh, who is part of our support team, who can then reach back, ask for further questions, things like that. Um, and then once it gets to a point where we have enough um information um by that point in time you know kirsty who's our senior product manager will come around and uh just make sure that everything makes sense she doesn't require any other information and it'll be moved to the backlog um so it's really important to you know have that understanding of what the problem actually is what the customer might be struggling with 
um, because if you just have a vote, as Emma said, a vote doesn't tell you what the problem actually is. Um, and what we tend to find, and I'm sure this is um, a fairly relevant statement, is that users just know that they have a problem. They don't necessarily even know what the problem might be. They might be focused on a particular solution, but that solution that they think might fix their issue might just be a temporary symptom that they're suffering from or suffering of. Um, so by just making sure you're asking questions and, and you know, having that conversation that you can actually start to understand how you might approach um, the actual problem. Uh, with all of that said, we do have this, the results to the poll. 50% uh, said yes, 30% said no, wish we could do more. 10% uh, said no, wish PowerPoint could work differently. So we could, uh, we'd love to talk about that, whoever mm. that was. Um, and no, we don't have requirements too. Mm. Yeah, so like, like Andrea said, um, if you either said that you would like to do more, then we are definitely, um, you know, we're always available for conversations. We can talk through your use case and and different approaches that might work to introduce that in your organization. Um, we've helped lots and lots of companies to introduce feedback processes. And equally, if you wish it would work in a certain way, um, either head to our website and, and add it in our feedback portal or drop us a line on Intercom or just mention it now in the in the chat and we'll capture that feedback for you um, and, and um, and uh, discuss it further with you. Cool. So, um, looking at like some of the popular product methodologies then, and like um, just to talk through how your setup might look slightly different depending on on what your what your methodology of choice was or what your process is like based on. So we do have a wide variety of customers, like just from from startups to scale ups to large enterprises. We've got B2B, B2C, B2B2C. We've got all sorts of customers, um, software, hardware, services even. Um, and, uh, you know, we've spoken to thousands of customers over the years and each organization has like slightly different processes and chosen methodologies. And obviously this depends on what works best for you and your organization and also like where you are in your, in your product journey and, and introducing product thinking to your company. Um, I've just picked out like here's a few of the ones we hear um, most commonly, um, but like I mentioned at the start, we're just going to focus on two examples and how um, we're not naming names or using like a specific customer, but just based on customers we've spoken to, how the setups are slightly different um, based on the methodology of choice. Like I mentioned, we're going to look at dual track agile and design thinking. So if you're not familiar with dual track agile, um, here's it summed up in a nice image for you. Um, but basically these teams will balance the day-to-day -day work across both the discovery and delivery, keeping both streams of work moving at the same time, rather than more of a waterfall approach, which would involve you doing the discovery and then delivering on it and not kind of keeping that feedback loop going and, and iterating as you are working on that idea. And uh, the key to this sort of process is keeping your product ideas backlog in ProbPad separate from your development or like delivery backlog, which would normally sit in JIRA like we looked at before. And like I mentioned, not only does this benefit the development backlog by helping that just be full of refined and validated, prioritized, well-scoped ideas, um, but because you're using ProbPad for the discovery side, it helps you to um, keep that side of the process moving too through things like the workflow, the impact and effort scoring, um, and you can keep those ideas moving through your workflow. So looking at how a customer might, might set up their prod pad for um, dual track agile type approach, this, uh, these are the sort of things you might see or you might think about including. So normally if a customer is is working in a dual track agile way their workflow will clearly set out the discovery process um, steps the development steps and then the post release and, and feedback stages um, so these might include things like research design sprint planning and then importantly closing that feedback loop with customers so that's what a, a workflow might include and then roadmap initiatives 
will probably include those across um, both discovery and delivery stages with um, roadmap cards more in the now column being more on the delivery end of things moving all the way to later roadmap card initiatives being more on the discovery side and then this sort of customer um, might have like quarterly objectives that they review and so they'll make sure that all of their roadmap initiatives are matched to those quarterly objectives so that's just some of the things we've seen from customers that work in like a dual track agile way looking at design thinking um, now so the double diamond process it maps the divergent and convergent stages of a design process so it helps you to work iteratively and incrementally in a way that allows companies to respond to what is learnt, um like in the mail in the real world um, to then refine and adapt the product and so teams that work in this way tend to um, as the name suggests, be focused more on like the research side and prototyping iteration as they're learning more insights um, and iterating on their product. So this type of customer that's using this type of approach, their workflow might have um, stages that include things like problem exploration um, and a prototype set, uh, like stage, um, a stage where they're gathering insights um throughout you know as they're moving through the the double diamond um and then having a prioritization stage as well um for their roadmap initiatives um this might actually you know whether it's in the now column or the later column or the next column for that matter their roadmap cards might actually contain a mix of both um, ideas in discovery and delivery depending on what the aims of that um, initiative is basically um because of how the nature of how these um these companies are working. Um, but just some things to think about when you are setting up your own processes. It might be that you know you're looking at that whole from outcomes to delivering and feedback and everything in between and thinking, you know, I've got some version of this, but I don't even know what this looks like. Maybe you're just mapping it out. Maybe you know you've got roadmaps and, and feedback nailed, but you're looking at introducing objectives. Well, regardless of, of what process you're looking to establish or, or review, these are the key questions we'd sort of consider suggest you consider for each of these um like who is responsible for this process and like how often is it going to take place. So like for example your objectives if you work quarterly, um, then you know that's going to you're going to be checking your objectives less regularly, maybe than you will be feedback, for example, which might be daily or triaging that feedback and mapping it to ideas. Um, how should it be managed? Um, importantly, we showed you how how these things can be managed within ProPad today. Where is this currently located? If you're just starting to look at how, um, say, you're introducing a feedback process in ProPad, you've probably got feedback coming in all over the shot and 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 not really sure how to consolidate that. Um, we've shown you some some ideas today of how you can do that in ProPad. And then how are you going to communicate this process? So, you know, it's all and I, I was a project manager, so it's all very well def defining a process that's brilliant. Uh, but if you don't tell anyone about it and don't make it um, inform like, you know, tell them in a way that they're going to be able to adopt it or consider their points of view, then it will never it'll never have traction. So importantly, you need to make sure you bring in all the right stakeholders into that process as you're defining it and communicating it effectively and making sure you're getting that buy-in um, and helping solve their problems. Um, this slide has a lot of information in it and we are gonna send it out as a resource afterwards. If you wanna take a screenshot, um, go for it. Um, but basically what we, we've suggested is, um, and we get this question actually quite frequently, is how often should I be doing these things? So all that process we've talked through today, um, something that I haven't touched on, but it's in here, uh, if you're interested, is how often should you be looking at each of these um, steps of the process? Um, and um, each of these areas will need a regular action, you know, whether it's feedback or objectives, you're going to have to keep looking at it and doing something with it in order to keep all of these cogs of the process working effectively and avoid any blockers to the work. Um, this will depend and vary on like your team, but it might be worth mapping out internally either for yourself or for your team to sort of define like how regularly you're going to spend on each of these activities. Um, and just making sure that you are actually spending time on these things, um, you know, 
it's all very well opening opening your feedback portal but if you don't have any process behind it for actively reviewing it you're just going to end up with a large uh, uh, you know feedback backlog that then becomes disheartening because you don't know what to do with it and it's just a load of information and it's actually really valuable to set up all these processes so all things worth considering um so the benefits of using ProdPad for refining your product processes and um, effectively embedding your methodology of choice is that ProdPad is inclusive. Um, we have unlimited reviewers on all of our plans. So we're really trying to help you communicate product within your organization and, and help bring people into that. Um, as part of that, we're helping you to build an open and transparent process. I, I'm obsessed with the workflow, but the workflow is a key way of you being able to do that. It's really clear how you're validating ideas and how an idea comes to fruition. Um, so having that clear that everyone can have access to is really valuable. Um, and something we we consistently see repeatedly with customers that implement ProdPad is that part of standardizing and aligning their processes really helps you to be more effective in building your products and being successful with them. Um, it's also accessible, uh, easy to read, easy to understand where things are. And obviously, we've got our integrations with other tools. So yes, product, ProdPad is probably going to be where the product team spends most of their time. Um, but we integrate really well with Slack. And um, we have like our Chrome extension and Jira integrations, Trello, et cetera. So all your colleagues that tend to spend their day to day elsewhere, they don't necessarily have to go into ProdPad to, to bring you that valuable information and, and contribute. Um, so, well, I'll open the, the floor to questions now. I've pulled off some common questions that we get around this. So maybe I'll start answering some of these. Um, and then if there's any questions that come in, Andrea, we can um, maybe address them. Um, so the first common question we tend to see is around like, like I kind of mentioned actually, like how do we communicate this process with the rest of the organization? So I would suggest Think about how you normally communicate change management. Now, this might not necessarily be something that you do as a product person, but you're bound to have done some change management um, as part of your role. But think about how your organization normally manages this. You know, do you have an intranet? Are you very meeting heavy? Like, you know, if it's not for a meeting, it doesn't really exist. Um, what's the best way to roll it out between the teams as well? So like Slack, I mentioned, you know, our integration is really strong. You know, you can have discussions in the threads in Slack and it'll be pulled through into ProdPad underneath the idea and the discussions. So your colleagues really don't have to access ProdPad, um, but you can still tap into the valuable information they share. And then as a project manager before, I can't help but uh, suggest you create a project plan. I know that product managers don't tend to like the word project management, but I promise you coming up with a plan um, and who you're going to target and how you're going to roll each bit of the process out. And importantly, what problems you're going to solve for your internal stakeholders and the benefits for them will really help you to gain uh, traction. Um, I'm happy to move on to the other questions, but if there's any questions that have come through, um, we could maybe pause and answer some of them. Uh, yeah, we do have quite a few questions, actually. So uh, maybe for the hours up, we can focus on those. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is um, the challenge I have with problem based roadmap cards is that not all ideas are done. So I'm not able to close the roadmap card to provide evidence of advancement. Mm, I my gut like book a chat with us, but my gut would say your roadmap card is probably too big. Um, so say if you're looking at like a roadmap card initiative that maybe is around something that might go on for a long time. Like say if you're doing a UX review or something like that, um, rather than have everything on that review in one initiative, actually what problems are you gonna tackle for your UX? Um, so for example, we did a whole roadmap um, update to this view like, like a year or two ago now. And it was broken down into like, I think four phases. So the first phase would have been around like, you know, front end stuff or and the second phase might have been around like objectives, for example. So I would probably my guess would be that your initiatives are too big um, and you're doing things that are a lot longer term. It might even be that actually your initiatives might sh maybe be objectives, but without an example. Um, but like I say, we do roadmap clinics, so um, do become one of those and we can we can talk through in a little bit more detail about your context. Uh, the other thing I would add is it depends on what your definition of done is. Um, is done 
implemented or is done you're done with everything else but you haven't tackled those ideas yet <laughs> um so it does kind of um it depends, like I said. So one thing to keep in mind is that not everything that's in the roadmap card needs to be marked as quote unquote done in order for the initiative to be completed. It might be that some items were failed experiments. It might be that you decided not to do some other items, you know, didn't pass validation or discovery or whatever it might be. Um, so you can work with the workflows. Um, as Emma said, she loves a good workflow. <laughs> that yeah. just really highlights, you know, what happened to those ideas at the end. Um, even if you decide that those ideas will be tackled in a second phase, um, then when you move the card to completed, just write as part of your outcome, we decided to then create phase two on this roadmap card and move some of those ideas we didn't get to, to the second phase. Um, so that, that might be another way of approaching um, the problem. Uh, cool. Next question here is, uh, what does clicking want do on the portal? Uh, does it increment the thumbs up counter? What happens if a user clicks want and does nothing else? Yeah. So no, so the thumbs up on an idea, um, this is internal. So what happens is a prop pad user within your organization, they might like this idea and then they're prompted to say why they like this idea. So you're going to get instantly why I want this. I, I think so, they were referring to the portal. Oh yeah, but the with the voting. So oh, yeah, what happens is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they're separate things, sorry. So the voting happens in there, that's for internal prop ad users. With the portal, what happens is if they click um, want, they're faced with the, they give their name, email and their feedback. They then hit submit feedback and that goes into the feedback section as unsorted. So you know that this is new feedback that hasn't been reviewed. And then you would go through that process of triaging it, making sure, you know, you could go back to that customer and ask for a little bit more detail um, or, and then the ultimate aim is to add it to ideas um, to build up that evidence of need. Cool, hope that helped. Um, our next question is um, from Ben who says, we just set it up to capture feedback via the API using our own form. That's super awesome. Um, and I wonder if there is a way for specific people to get a notification in the triage situation. Um, the quick answer to that is um, we are going to review the notifications um, in the app. Um, there is an idea for that. Um, so another way you might be able to work through that might be with the API as well, um, perhaps setting up your own, you know, version of notification so that whenever a new idea is added or activated or moved to the backlog, then it triggers a notification for someone on your end. Um, generally, uh, for feedback, um, if you get mentioned on an idea or a new idea is created or a new piece of feedback is created, um, then you would get notified. Uh, but moving items to backlog and things like that. Um, there's no concept of following for feedback at this time. Uh, but like I said, you can always, um, if, if you're comfortable using the API, um, then uh, that, that might be a way around it. Uh, our next question is, when you're tagging feedback to find signals, how do you keep them under control? Um, for example, <laughs> label versus label with a capital L or a lowercase L or uh, labels. Okay. Yeah, so we do try and help that um, as part of, I'm assuming you're meaning like with tags. Am I understanding that right? Yeah. So basically we try and manage that through the type ahead um, tag. So basically when they start typing label, they will see if there's already been one with label. I don't think it matters whether it's um, like if I do access. See, it still shows access. So it doesn't actually matter if it's um, capitalized or not. They will then basically we're prompting them to select something that already exists. Does that uh, help on circus? Uh, it does. That being said, um, it is our friend Colin. And I know Colin is part of a very big account uh, yes. <laughs> with a lot of admins. Um, usually what I would recommend is limit the number of admins where possible um, so that, you know, you don't have a bunch of different people creating things. And even then, maybe just decide who can actually 
create tax, if that helps. Um, as an example, uh, our senior product manager, Kirsty, has really locked it down <laughs> so that she is the only person that can create um, a, a tag. It's almost a somewhat unsaid internal rule, at least in terms of um, the product team. She is the one that creates tags. If I want to create a new tag, I'll just check with her to make sure it doesn't ruin her system because she does have a system that she works with. Um, and I don't know how it works for your team um, Emma, if you if you're allowed to just create tags at random, but I know for the product team, <laughs> it's very locked down. Yeah, like I think it's part like unfortunately at the moment we don't have anything internally uh, like in Propad to help with that, but we will obviously take that as feedback. Um, and I know that I know that we're like the product team are really interested in how to manage tags better. Um, but yeah, I think it's part of like how you roll it out and what you kind of like when you're asking people to use the system, uh, like your crib sheet, your one page about here's how we use PropPad, like having in there about like use these, like don't create new tags and things like that. Yep, so I hope that uh, that helped. Uh, we are working on some other cool stuff, um, which I don't know that I'm able to say anything about just yet, <laughs> but definitely adding a little bit of context for teams and things like that. Um, we know um, tagging is a is an interesting monster to tackle. Mm. Um, the next question is, if FIFA comes in via the want button, then is it automatically linked to the idea? The answer is yes. Um, it'll be linked to the idea and it'll be placed in unsorted anyway. Uh, the reason for that is because if somebody hits want, and then just types yes, then that's still not really telling you what the problem is. Um, and it happens, you know, um, you might just want to make sure that you have all the relevant information from the customer. Uh, do we have any other questions at this time? Uh, while I say that I am going to launch the last poll, oh, yes, um, you. if you all wouldn't mind uh, giving us a little bit of feedback. Um, but if you have any other questions or if you want us to answer any of the questions that are on the screen right now, um, if you could let us know, that would be super duper helpful. Um, and we can, we can get on them right now. Mm -hmm. No, I think, I think we're good perhaps. Well, just to um, reiterate as well, um, the customer success team at PropPad were always happy to chat. Obviously, for the purposes of this um, sort of like webinar, we have to keep it quite um, general. Um, obviously, we've only looked at dual track agile and design thinking. But if you want to look at um, how to better embed PropPad or use PropPad to um, refine your own processes and you want to talk specifically about your context, then just reach out to us and we'll, we'll book a meeting in and uh, we can, um, you know, spend some time reviewing that with you, get you set up. Um, yeah, and we've done the poll. So yeah, I mean, if there's no other questions from anyone, then um, we can let you enjoy the rest of your day. I was gonna say the rest of your Friday. I clearly have no idea what day it is. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's not Friday. Who knows it's what day Tuesday. is anymore? <laughs> it's Tuesday. Yeah, it's everyone, Tuesday you still have to go to work tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. Well, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. As Emma said, if you still have any questions, you can always reach out um, at hello at propat.com. Um, if you're a Twitter fan, you can reach us um, through our Twitter handle. So it's at propat. Um, we also have a success email address, I believe, success at powerpad.com. Any of those, um, you know, drop us a line. You can also do it through the app um, and we can schedule in a session with you. Um, so have uh, a great rest of the day. And again, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us today. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>